for Oscar, it is still being worked on, but one of the main reasons that it's taking me so long is because the embroidery on the embroidery machine just takes a really long time to stitch out. And not only does stitching it out take time, which it does, and I have to sit there and babysit it because otherwise it jams like it's an old printer, but I have to feed the embroidery thread through it, which is a pain in itself, but just the process of digitizing and planning out embroidery is a pretty time intensive process so that's what's taking me so long on Frau's skirt is getting all that gold embroidery done so I thought it might be interesting for you guys to see how I do design and digitize and get all of the embroidery stitched out and onto the skirt and it would also give me a little bit more time to finish the skirt up so <laughs> that's what I'm gonna be going through this week I hope that it's interesting I had a really hard time finding resources on machine embroidery and how to plan it out and make sure it's the right size and then also just the actual act of digitizing was really hard to find instructions from I ended up spending a lot of money on courses and they were really helpful and they really helped me learn a lot but I think that this is information that like you should be able to have for free if you are purchasing a really expensive embroidery software so the embroidery software that i bought is hatch and that's costing me eleven hundred dollars like it's literally over a thousand dollars i'm doing a payment plan uh, that's an option but on top of that i had to pay a lot for embroidery classes the machine also costs a lot so it seems kind of absurd that you're already paying so much as just an entry point that you should then have to spend hundreds of dollars just to learn how to use it. So I'm hoping that I can kind of clear stuff up and make it a little bit easier to start out with embroidery if that's what you want to do. I am not going to go completely into it because like I don't want them coming after me saying that I gave all their information away for free. So I'll just be going over the basics and hopefully that can kind of get you started if you're also interested in machine embroidery. So the first step to making your embroidery is obviously designing it. You have to know what you're going to be putting into the embroidery software and what you want to digitize before you can actually do any of it. Having a good mock-up helps so much with this process because it gives you something just to draw directly onto or pin stuff onto. I personally prefer drawing on paper, cutting it out, and then pinning it to the mock-up because then I don't have to worry about like if I mess up then I can't erase it, I get confused, all of that. If I mess up and it's on paper I can literally just take it off and it makes it so much easier. So that's what I'm going to be doing for materials. It's really simple. I just have a pair of scissors pencil, pencil sharpener, paper, and a whole bunch of safety pins. So I literally will just draw these designs out on paper, cut them out, and then safety pin them to the mock-up. If I decide that it's ugly and I don't like it, then I'll just change it. So I've got my reference image. I'm just looking at this back view design and I'm just gonna try to copy what I see, but also like take some creative liberties because it's hard to translate this 100% to the embroidery. So the embroidery field on my machine is only five by seven. So while I'm drawing these really big shapes, I am gonna have to break them down into smaller shapes if I want them to actually be physically possible to be embroidered on my machine. But for the time being, I'm just gonna draw everything out as I would want it to look when it's finished and then I can worry about breaking it down later. Okay, so now that I have everything all planned out, or at least I have what I think is it's all planned out, I'm gonna scan this into my computer. So I just take it over to my scanner. And this process will obviously depend on what your scanner is like. This is just how I do it on my scanner. But I take it over to my scanner and I scan it in at the full eight and a half by 11 size so, so that it stays to the real life scale and doesn't get resized at all. Hello, okay, so it's been a while since I've done a voiceover, but hello, it's a voiceover Minji now. First, I like to do a scan overview, which helps make sure I'm getting everything in there that I want. I change the file name to something that's a little bit more helpful than just scan, then control A to select all and go ahead and click scan. Once that's scanned, I can go into my folder with a scanned in image and change it to a PNG because I forgot to change the format and Hatch will only import a PNG image. To run Hatch, I have to use Parallels Desktop to run Windows because Hatch doesn't work with Apple computers. The first thing I do when I open a new document in Hatch is to change the background color to white because I hate looking at the gray background. Click on Artwork to insert the scan image and because it's too large an image to fit within the embroidery field shown by the red box, I'm going to just fit the lower part in, digitize that, and then digitize the top part separately. I'll just stitch it together by hand later. 
Once the art is in the right place, I select the Digitize Open Shape tool and set my stitch length to 4mm with a minimum of 1.75mm. I like to digitize in purple because the other colors are hard to look at after a while. I digitize one shape at a time and go around each shape then make a ladder zigzag for the underlay. I think this is actually opposite of what you're supposed to do. The zigzag should go first and then go around the shape with the outline, but it worked fine this way so I'm not redoing it. <laughs> the underlay keeps the stabilizer together and also keeps all the threads in the right place once the stabilizer is dissolved. After the base layer, I select digitize blocks and I use that tool to make the actual shape. Don't forget to set it to fill rather than just outline. Also something to remember when you're digitizing freestanding lace is that you always need to turn the underlay off because you are putting in your own underlay. So you don't want the software to also put in its own underlay. Because this part is darker, I want to use a tatami stitch so it reflects less light and I just play around with the stitch spacing until it seems like it'll cover the shape effectively without being too dense. Around 0.6 to 0.8 millimeters is usually a good range. Repeat this whole process for the next shape, but because I didn't shade this one in when I was sketching it, I'll use a satin stitch to make it shinier. For satin stitch, I usually use a 0.6 millimeter stitch distance. So here I'm just continuing with the digitize blocks tool and then I hit enter so that it makes the shape. And then after that I can change the properties of the satin stitch, changing the stitch distance there. And next I can change the shape if I think it's not smooth enough, if it looks kind of strange. And basically just keep repeating for the entire shape. I try to do the darker shapes first since I'm trying to make them seem more recessed. So the lighter shapes should look like they're sitting on top of the darker shapes. When you click off of True View and click the Digitize Open Shape again, you can see where that square is. That's where I left off with the stitching in the last one. So I need to make sure that the next shape connects to where that square is so that there's no skips when it's stitching out. You really don't want any loose floating threads just kind of chilling out on your embroidery. So you want to make sure that you're always connecting each shape from the last square to the next shape. So just over and over again, digitize open shape for the outline and zigzag underlay, then digitize blocks for the actual shape and choose between a satin stitch and tatami stitch depending on how light or how dark you want the shape to appear. This is going to be an under shape, so it's the darker tatami stitch and I'm doing it before I get to all of the shapes around it which are going to be the lighter satin stitches. And satin stitches just end up looking lighter because the threads are longer so they reflect more light without being broken up. This is going to be another undershape that I'm outlining right now. It's kind of like the inside part of the full spiral. So again, I'm doing this before all of that and it'll just get covered up. You also want to make sure that you are connecting all of your pieces together so that when you do stitch it out and you dissolve the stabilizer, things don't just kind of separate. So you want to make sure there's a bridge between each shape and usually that's either by overlapping the underlay into the next shape over or doing a zigzag between the two shapes before you do get like the digitized blocks tool on top of it so that gets all hidden. You just want to make sure that everything is very stuck together and isn't going to fall apart when you take away all of its stabilizer. So once again we're doing the digitized blocks here and to use this tool you kind of go from side to side rather than going around a shape like in consecutive points I guess. So you do side to side in parallel rows. If you use the digitized blocks tool and the shape looks kind of sad and lumpy you can hit Control H and move the points around so they're smoother and less awkward looking. So that's what I'm doing here is I'm just smoothing that shape out and then you can go back and also do that for the underlay so all of your underlay is within the shape that you just digitized. You don't want your underlay to fall outside of the shape because then it'll be visible. You also don't want to trap yourself in a corner because any stitches on top of your stitching will be visible. Always work next to the shape you just made and make it so you can get easily to another shape. Sometimes that means you need to travel back to the far end of a shape with a single line so it gets hidden when you go back over it to get to the center but just <laughs> make sure that you're not trying to travel back to another shape after you've already digitized 
everything in that area because otherwise it's kind of ugly and messy. It's not the end of the world if you do, but you know, it happens. And then just <laughs> repeat this process over and over forever until you are done with the shape. Okay, this is my embroidery machine. I've got it set up in the living room right now. And I just wanted to talk about really quick how I stitch everything out, what's important to keep in mind when you are stitching stuff out on the embroidery machine. Uh, just like the kind of stuff you need to know so that it doesn't just jam and get stuck constantly and break all your thread because that happens a lot if you're not careful. <laughs> but while I am stitching stuff out, there's a few things that I like to keep with me. I have a pair of Cricut tweezers, I guess. Uh, and this is just really useful for when it does get jammed and I have to like fish thread out of the machine. Got a little tiny screwdriver so that I can get the needle changed out. You should probably be changing your needle every couple of big stitch outs just cause the needles do get dull and like they're making a lot of perforations. So two things that are really useful to have plus scissors, obviously you need that. Um, and then I also have like a huge back stock of needles. I just purchased them all from Wawa because it's a lot cheaper than buying them from Joann's. I think it's like $4 a pack instead of like the $8 a pack at Joann's. So lots of extra needles because they break a lot. They just need to be changed out a lot because they get dull. Just important things to have. Extra bobbin thread. You'll go through a lot of bobbin thread if you are stitching stuff out. And then obviously all of my embroidery thread. So my, I have a whole bunch of gold embroidery thread. That's literally all that's in this bag is a ton of embroidery thread. So this is the design that I'm gonna be stitching out. This is for the border of the skirt. And it's not the design that I just showed you guys how I was digitizing, but this is what needs to be stitched out next. So this is what I'm gonna be doing. I need 12 of these total. So I've gotten one stitched out and they take about an hour to stitch out. So this is gonna take another 11 hours to stitch out. And this is really taking the most amount of time on this project is that I just have to sit there and babysit the embroidery machine. Otherwise the thread gets tangled and it snaps and then I have to reset it all. So that's what I'm gonna be stitching out. This is water soluble stabilizer. It's what you use when you are making freestanding lace and it's exactly what it sounds like. You put it in water and it dissolves. I will be using regular stabilizer, like regular tearaway stabilizer when I'm doing some embroidery on satin and I'll show you guys that later. But for now I'm using the water soluble stabilizer. When you're hooping this, you wanna just make sure that it's really tight in there. So you just tighten it a bunch and then you pull it so that it's really just tight in there and you want it to be kind of like a drum. Otherwise the tension from the embroidery will make all of this pucker and it'll just not register correctly. So it's just, you want it to be hooped really tightly. Turn this on. This little USB stick right here is what has all of my designs on it. So it's really easy for me to just take this out of the machine, load it up onto my computer and transfer all the files into the USB. And then I just put it back in the machine and it works really easily. Okay, so this is a little bit of a janky setup, but where I soak this is in the kitchen because it's easiest to wipe any spills up in here. I have a dedicated Tupperware, so this never has food in it. It's labeled as the, it's just got tape on it, but it's, it's labeled as my dissolving water soluble stabilizer Tupperware. I soak these in filtered water because our water has a lot of iron in it, so I don't want that rust color to discolor anything and I just cut everything out pretty close to the edge so that there is less 
stabilizer that needs to be dissolved. Set everything to dry on a paper towel that's on top of a piece of foil. The foil is just there to keep it from leaking through to my counter because I don't want to destroy my counter. When you're rinsing this out, you do want to keep a little bit of the stabilizer in there so that, I don't know, it retains a little bit of stiffness. I mean, you could just do it so that it doesn't retain any stiffness. I just find that if I've made any mistakes in digitizing and things want to unravel a little bit, the extra little bit of stabilizer being in there helps everything stay together really well. Once there's been a lot of stabilizer dissolved into this, it kind of stops accepting anymore. I guess like it, it becomes oversaturated. What I'll do then once this has become kind of oversaturated with stabilizer is I'll let it dry out and then you can literally just peel the stabilizer out. I don't know if this is environmentally friendly or not. I assume that it's not. <laughs> and I assume it's probably not good to pour this down my drain because it solidifies. So that's kind of my solution is that I can just toss it in the trash rather than hurting any plants by tossing it outside or hurting my plumbing by tossing it in the sink. The process for digitizing embroidery onto satin is a lot simpler than digitizing freestanding lace because you don't have to lay out all the underlay yourself. So I'm not gonna go over digitizing that, but I am gonna show how it's a little bit different for hooping it and for actually stitching it out. So first off, the stabilizer is different. This is this tear away stabilizer. It looks kind of like paper towels. I'm just gonna use one layer of this rather than the double layer that I was using for water soluble. This is gonna be a border motif, so I'm doing it on like a long strip instead of on one kind of piece. I'm gonna just make sure that the edge of the strip of satin is parallel to the edge of the embroidery hoop so that everything kind of stays nice and lined up. And that's what this stuff is for. Basting adhesive spray and it's temporary so it should wash out. Not that I'm ever really gonna wash this, but theoretically this should work. I've never actually done it. This was suggested by a friend. I'm just gonna spray onto the stabilizer. Okay, so I've loaded in the design and just to make sure that this is gonna be stitching in the middle of my strip of satin, I'm gonna click adjust, lay out, and then I'm gonna press this thing that looks like a little needle and the like square. all of these little round pieces that were on the satin stitched out as well as a bunch of these snowflakes and once you've got pieces that go together you can just sew them together and it makes a kind of more complex composited design and it makes it look like more than all of its pieces. So I'm still working on this piece here. It's made up of those round pieces that were stitched onto satin and that has the tearaway stabilizer on it and those are all stitched together like end to end and then I've stitched a snowflake on top of 
the intersections of each one. So this is covering the join here and it's a little bit visible when you look at it up close, but it's not visible from far away. And then I'm also just adding a lot of beading to it. So you can see that it's got two rows of beading, one along the inner edge. This side I've only done the inner edge. So I've done the inner edge there and then I've gotten the outer edge here. And I'm kind of trying to make it so that they're not sitting on the embroidery so much as sitting so they give a little bit more of an interesting profile than just the rounded edge. And then when that's all done, that's gonna get stitched to the front of the jug, the skirt. This also gets some pieces that go like that, but I've decided that I don't like the ones that I stitched out already. I think they stick out a little bit too much. So I've altered the digitized design a little bit and I've made it so that they're a little squatter and wider so that they like cover a little bit more of the space, but those are still being stitched out. So those will come up later, but this is kind of what the whole design looks like. So once you put these all together, it looks really complex and it looks like it's a lot of effort, which it is, but um, it definitely looks more interesting than it would if it was just each of these pieces alone. But because the whole finished piece is pretty wide and pretty long, I wasn't able to stitch them all as one thing because that's the stitching field of my embroidery machine. So with the limitations of the embroidery machine, I kind of work within each piece and then I can put them all together afterwards. So this will get stitched to the center front. And then I've got a lot of these little applique pieces here and those will get stitched like applique. So those will just get stitched onto the rest of the body of the skirt. I've got a whole bag here and they just, there are each of the little pieces and those will get placed on the design and stitched down. You can see here how I've used some of those embroidered pieces in conjunction with a different kind of detailing. This is like a slash and puff design and the embroidered parts cover kind of like the ugly points here where it's not so nice, but it makes it so that this whole design comes together and there's a lot of different textural elements. It's also going to get some beading and resin gems in the center here, but the resin will be coming in the next video, so stay tuned for that. I've mostly got to get to work putting these all together, so I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it wasn't that much of the like nice pretty ASMR sewing detail kind of stuff, but hopefully it was informative enough to make up for that and I hope you like this video. If you want to see how all of the embroidery looks when it's actually on the skirt, that will be coming soon in the skirt video. And then if you want to see how all of these elements kind of play together, I'm going to be making a video about how I cast resin gems and how to bead them so they look kind of part of the skirt rather than just gems stuck on top of a skirt. So that'll be coming for next week and then the week after hopefully is going to be the skirt video where all of these techniques will be combined into one garment. So that's the plan. Hopefully that is how it goes. I don't know if you guys have seen my community post but I have had a little bit of problems with my studio. We had a pipe leaking right before we left to go see Micah's parents in Chicago and then we went to go see Micah's parents and that was a multi-day drive there and back as well as when we got back we didn't have heat on our house so we've just kind of had a lot of mishaps. So I'm running a little bit behind schedule on everything. I feel like I say that a lot but I'm running behind schedule so please bear with me. Um, that's that's it. That's all I've got for this video. So please stay tuned for the next one. Do you like how this turned out? Let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them as always. If you have any uh, suggestions for how to do this better. I mean, I'm still learning how to digitize properly. So like I am not the expert on digitizing. Like I still get things like this where they are not entirely uh, compact, but you know, I'm learning, so I guess if you have any tips that I missed or if it's just a learning curve kind of thing, then let me know. And I hope to see you guys in the next video. Okay, bye!